Hi, everybody. Welcome to this episode of UNLV Research Files. I'm Gary Waddell. We have a very exciting show for you today. We'll talk to the Associate Dean of the Honors College. We'll take a look at UNLV's new geo-visualization lab, and we'll talk to Sean Gerstenberger about his work on childhood lead poisoning. But we begin tonight with Tom Piotta. He is the Interim Vice President for Research and Economic Development. Good to have you with us again. Yeah, Thanks for be being back. here. We sort of have breaking news today, so <laughs> I'm going to bury the lead a minute. But let's talk. Right. The UNLV, uh, the Nevada Legislature in 2011, uh, founded what they called the Knowledge Fund. Tell us a little bit about what that is. Well, yeah, the Knowledge Fund. It's a great opportunity for the state really to advance innovation-based economic development, and really what that means is how can the great work that goes on in the university help with economic diversification in the state? How can we have applied research centers? That, that are in engineering and science and other areas help with advancing the economy in Nevada, create new jobs, have commercialization efforts that create new companies also, and really just help with the overall um, economic development in Nevada. And they provide grants to the school and you applied, right? Right, we applied for grants. We had really three uh, focus areas that we were um, applied in. Those were in quantitative health sciences. This is how can we um, work with uh, industry partners. Those include uh, people like uh, the Lou Ruvo Center for Brain Health, mm -hmm. which is associated with the Cleveland Clinic, right. Comprehensive Cancer Centers. How can we work with them on areas like clinical trials design? Um, other uh, health uh, partners that uh, in areas like health information technologies, areas around personalized medicine. How can we work with them in real applied areas and develop new technologies that may help with commercialization of these technologies and potentially create new jobs and new companies that may come out of the university too. That was one area. Um, the other area which which is really exciting and what Las Vegas is known for is in gaming innovation. Right. You know, gaming uh, and especially with internet gaming now, you're seeing a lot of new innovation taking place and with taking place with new games being formed. Mm -hmm. And we have some great faculty in our in our hotel college, and also working with great community partners like with uh, Mark Yusilov, who's um, working with students and faculty in terms of creating new games and actually patenting those, oh, wow. and then working to see how we can work with companies to license those technologies out, and then. Um, that, that creates a whole new revenue for the university to bring in um, from those technologies that are coming out from the university. So it's really exciting to see that. Yeah. And then number three? And then number three was around unmanned aerial systems. The state is, oh, yeah. is positioning itself to be really well known in this area now. So we're working collaboratively with the University of Nevada, Reno, the Desert Research Institute, and UNLV to, to become really well known in the, in the nation for research and development and supporting testing and the operations of unmanned aerial systems as that becomes something that's uh, coming out of the um, defense sector right, and, into more program, the, yeah. Yeah, and into more of the commercial airspace and how do you deal with all the issues associated with that. And here's the breaking news you learned this week. Just yesterday, um, two of our proposals, the uh, quantitative health sciences and our um, gaming innovation proposals got funded to, for a total of $3 million. Wow. And now we'll be receiving after we get final approval from the governor's Office of Economic Development, so that's really exciting. And does that just go on funding what you've already been doing, or will that be new programs? No, that's that's about bringing in some new faculty in the, these areas to build up those new programs and for them to start these efforts in terms of advancing those technologies. Tom, thank you very much. Very Great. exciting. Thank you, Gary. We said it was an exciting program. We start out with it. Thank you All very right. much. Thank I appreciate you. it. Up next, a peek inside the life science professor Kelly Sang's lab. We will take a peek. Here is China Green with a story. Salamanders can grow a new tail following an injury, but humans can't. UNLV researcher Kelly Tsing wants to know why. She's studying South African frogs for signals that lead to the repair of damaged or lost body parts. We hope to uncover some of the really important signals which are important for initiating regeneration. So signals that tell the tissue, hey, you're missing a part, now you need to regrow. So once we can identify these signals, hopefully we can apply it to, for example, more complex models such as mammals and see if these signals can actually work. To identify signals in the regenerative process, Tsing generates embryos that grow into tadpoles. She puts them to sleep, chops off their tails, and then studies the result of biochemical or bioelectrical manipulations. Normally people think of genes or DNA as kind of being one of the signals, 
but it turns out bioelectrical signals such as ion currents can also play a role in this process. Singh says her research may lead to regenerative therapies for damaged or aging tissue in humans, but a lot of work needs to be done before that can happen. The human body is very, very complex, so you know we're all working very hard to try to understand all the different signals that are available, and hopefully you know, we can put together all our knowledge and try to identify therapies that might work in the future. Undergraduate students who work with Singh in the lab say the opportunity is challenging but rewarding. You get something you can't get in the typical classroom. You know, you actually get to see biology happening in front of you rather than just like memorizing random terms. And it's interesting because you feel like you're making a difference and you're learning things and you're discovering things. Dr. Singh is amazing. She teaches you how to be a scientist. Instead of answering your questions, she wants you to think about it. She wants you to learn how to get the process down so that way you will learn how to use it later for yourself. Research is also a very important part of educating the students. Being able to do research and understanding how science actually occurs is a very important part for them when they want to go to medical school or you know, become a scientific researcher. For UNLV Research Files, I'm China Green. Joining me now is Andrew Hansen, who is the Associate Dean for the Honors College here at UNLV. Uh, let's start with the basics. Tell me what the Honors College is. The Honors College is a subunit within the university. It's a college of its own, but it's not like other colleges in that it's not discipline focused. Instead, we recruit students that are high achieving students to be in a small, tight knit community um, where they take a separate set of courses compared to most UNLV students. It's meant to mimic um, a small liberal arts education within a major research university. Um, it has two programs. There's one that is where most of our students are. That is what I just described with students coming in straight out of high school usually. Um, and they are from all 200 majors across campus. Uh, our second program is what we call Department Honors and that's where the research in the Honors College is really focused. We saw in this last story that even undergraduates can take part in research at UNLV. Absolutely. So the, the Department Honors program is a year long research pro project. Um, it's meant to mimic a miniature master's thesis project um, where students working with a faculty advisor from their home discipline uh, settle on a topic. They figure out something that they can do that will either create new knowledge or it can be a, um, a performance um, if it's from the fine arts side of the university, for example. Um, but they create something new. They create new knowledge. They create a new, new uh, visual uh, performance or whatever. Um, and so in, the year, in that year-long course, they work with the advisor and with, the, with myself in the Honors College to learn how to write a, a compelling proposal about what they plan to do, where they do a literature review, and then say, these are the things I'm going to try to do, and here's how I'm going to go about doing it. And then they actually go and do that research. And then in the second semester is where they learn how to uh, record the results, interpret that, draw conclusions about it, and, and leave us with some new advancement in our knowledge. Can you give us a couple of specifics? Sure. Um, there are numerous things that students do, and this is a really fun part about my job, is I get to work with these really interest, really bright students on really interesting projects. So f a couple examples of things that are going on right now is we have um, a student who is a chemistry major who's mm -hmm. focusing on how certain enzymes function within cells in order to remove products that the cell no longer needs. So it's the, the, the vacuum cleaner part of the cell. Uh, we have another student who um, is doing a translation of a German book into English. And so that's, that's actually a re really fascinating one for me. Um, we have um, other examples. So we have an engineering student and she's working with a naturally occurring material called pozolons which actually the ancient Greeks and Romans used as a substitute for Portland cement. And so we know that these things have persisted for long periods of time. Portland cement breaks down much faster, so mm -hmm. she's investigating whether we can use these in modern building. And one of the benefits of that is you don't have to do some of the processing things that you do when you use Portland cement that contribute to greenhouse gases. So there's a really, really interesting um, focus that has other benefits above and beyond just understanding how we can use construction materials in new ways. Quickly, how do students get involved in this? So students have to apply for both of those programs um, and so 
they, uh, they, they submit an application to, to the Honors College. They first have to identify a faculty member and that faculty member has to agree to work with the student. And then we work with them to figure out exactly what that's gonna be. And they submit the required materials and then we say you're, you're in. And then, then they start that year long process I described. And at the end of that year, what, what do they get from that other than a great, great project that, that is theirs? Great question. Um, one of the things that we like to tout in this is that this is great training for graduate education. And almost all of our students wanna go on to law school, professional school, or graduate school. So they leave here with research experience. Um, and that's definitely a plus when the student is applying to go on to graduate school. So if I can give you one example, we had a student named Vanessa Hamario Cano who focused on, her research was, was looking at the way in which the UN played a role in certain civil wars. When she was done with her, her thesis, she applied to numerous graduate schools. She got accepted to the Elliott School of International Affairs at oh, George wow. Washington University. She accepted that offer, and that meant she turned down offers from Columbia, George Washington University, Georgetown, and American University. Wow. So it really gives students a great leg up on pretty, where they're going to go next. Pretty special students. Yeah. Andrew, thank you very much. We, we appreciate it. Sounds, My pleasure. sounds wonderful. If engineering professor Bob Beam had his way, every rooftop in Las Vegas would sport a solar panel. Gary Larson tells us why. Bob Beam has been studying solar energy for more than 40 years. We've uh, had projects uh, in a number of locations uh, around the valley, uh, some with the Las Vegas Valley Water District, for example. Uh, we had a zero energy house we uh, designed and evaluated with a local home builder. Uh, we've worked in the El Dorado Valley, uh, some initial work with Nevada Solar One. So projects have been all over the place as well as in uh, the campus area here specifically. So we have a nice facility over on Flamingo where we have some very large systems that we evaluate. And on the top of our engineering building, we also have a laboratory. The solar generation systems on campus produce enough energy to power 20 homes. We also are uh, willing to help uh, companies in the area if they've got some products that are related to this kind of thing. We always try to help them in some way uh, and try to get them in the market. In 2013, UNLV's Center for Energy Research was named as one of five regional test sites for new products in photovoltaics. We're uh, in the midst of really getting that up and running at the present time. That's uh, a really nice honor to be one of the only five that uh, across the United States. They're each in all different climatic zones, so things can be evaluated in sort of a consistent manner. But Beam says the real purpose of all the solar projects is to teach students. Whenever we have projects, uh, we always have a fair number of graduate students involved in it. One of our primary purposes is educational. We need to be training people, and uh, there's nothing like working on a project that gets them and kind of gets a feel for the real world. All the preparation, the training, it all comes down to this. To be a winning team, you have to work like a winning team. We have a job to do out here today. Some people think it's about muscle, but it's really about heart. A lot of heart. My team depends on me. And my team is 50,000 strong. what it feels like to be part of a team. A winning team. The action team. A team. Action team. Action team. Get in on the action at actionteam.org. Are you in? Joining me now is Sean Gerstenberger. He is the interim dean of the School of Community Health Services. Thank you for being with us, Sean. Appreciate it. Okay. I understand you were instrumental in founding this school. Well, I certainly played a role in uh, developing the School of Community Health Sciences, which is really public health. And uh, so we offer several degrees in public health and healthcare administration. And really uh, kind of the difference between some of the health sciences and, and other sciences is 
we look at a population or community level rather than an individual level. And that's one of the fundamental differences between a school of public health or community health sciences. So you're not, really, you're not graduating nurses, you're graduating people who will work for the health district or, exactly. or organizations we, like that. Right, we look at, at, at a population scale, so people who can work with policies or procedures or rules that protect populations, communities, organizations, processes. Um, so they can work in a vast array of areas, but they're not in a clinical setting. One of the things that uh, you do research on is lead poisoning. Uh, okay. I thought we outlawed lead in paint in the 19, what, 60s or something, <laughs> yeah, and it's over. We don't have to worry yeah. about it anymore. Not I, true. Huh? No, not true. I wish it was over. Um, we've been fortunate here to have several research grants um, from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to develop a childhood lead poisoning prevention program with um, Southern Nevada Health District, one of our key partners. And um, but one of the problems we've had with that is that, honestly, we view children as an indicator of where our lead is located. So we test kids, and then when they test positive for lead, we go back and look at their home, and then remove the lead from their home. And um, you know, public health is also about prevention. Absolutely. And so that's just completely backwards. And so we've got a couple of new grants funded now that I think are much more proactive and preventative in nature that are designed to remove the lead from the homes before the kids get poisoned. So where is lead now in the homes? A lot of it's in paint. And so the paint- Still? Yes, it was banned in 1978. Um, however, our homes are much, much older than True that. True than that, a lot of them are. And uh, one of the things that we've looked at is what we call kind of housing-based primary prevention. So identifying the oldest homes in the neighborhoods, um, testing them with, with a lot of my staff members, and we just wrote a large grant that got funded from uh, Housing Urban Development, or HUD, um, to go in and then abate and remove all the lead from those homes in Henderson communities. Mm -hmm. And we're thrilled to be able to go in. Um, if you think about it, many, many families can live in a home. So removing the lead from the house not only protects one family, but generations and, and numbers of children. And I would imagine that your research here even though this is a fairly young community, would mm -hmm. certainly translate to bigger cities in, in other parts of the country. Oh, absolutely. And um, you know, we have a little different housing profile and we sure. have some different sources of lead um, outside of paint. But the other piece of that is that uh, we also got some supplemental funding to deal with other um, housing related issues. And so the way we look at it is the home is a critical determinant of health. Um, most people spend 90 plus percent of their time in the indoors. And so what we do in our home and how we interact with it is important. Um, you think about things like uh, clutter. Um, we may have mm -hmm. a lot of material sitting around the house. That's a place for pests to live, which can be asthma triggers, cockroaches, mm -hmm. um, mice, rats, and other things. So we have some funding to go in and also deal with those types of issues. And the home is such an interconnected environment. Um, another problem we have here is, is moisture and water leaks. Mm -hmm. It doesn't rain very much, so a lot of people don't fix their roofs. Right. And when it does, that can come in. And one of the main reasons that paint fails in the home is because of moisture and exposure mm -hmm. to water. So it starts to flake or peel or chip, and then mm -hmm. it falls on the ground. A lot of the lead contained a um, compound called lead acetate, which is sweet. So when children oh. pick it up and place it in their mouth, it actually gives them kind of a positive reward structure, um, which can poison that child. So once again, kind of linking all these things that happen in the home to really prevent um, illnesses, disease, and problems uh, that we know are related to the home and the home environment. Seems like a huge project. Is are you making progress? Do you feel like you're you're, it you're is. getting your arms <laughs> around this thing? Uh, we're just starting uh, the whole abatement piece of that, uh -huh. um, but it's based on about ten years worth of research we've been doing here. I think I've been fortunate enough to graduate about 18 masters and PhD students that have kind of built the foundation up uh -huh. to this point, uh, where we dealt with chil uh, children testing children, getting that um, lead test done, which is still critical, but now we're moving into a lot of the more prevention pieces, which I'm thrilled to see us moving in, in that direction. You also have uh, the Landlord-Tenant Hotline. You got a grant for that. Tell us about we that. We do. It's also from Housing and Urban Development, a pretty substantial grant. That's uh, with our Southern Nevada Health District partners again. Uh, a lot of the previous work I was telling you about is in owner-occupied residences mm -hmm. or homes. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the really difficult housing situations that we face are those people that rent and poor conditions in rental areas. So we uh, worked with them and set up and developed a landlord-tenant hotline where people can call in to get assistance with housing-related issues that connect to health. Um, so we have kind of two pieces of that. One is a, an emergency service call where they call in 
and they can tell us I don't have running water, I don't have heat. Um, here I don't have air conditioning mm -hmm. for the most part. <laughs> yeah, that is important. Is It's critical. It's yeah. some of the leading causes of death in the elderly in certain mm -hmm. parts of the world. So we have worked with them to develop um, some processes and papers to help them file the right paperwork to know who to call and what to do, to how to get the issue resolved. And you're not just talking about kids? No, that, that's for everybody. Um, we've been running the, the landlord-tenant hotline for about a year and a half, but now we've got a grant to evaluate its, its effectiveness to see if it's cost beneficial. And some of the major calls we get are for things like moisture, um, mold, pest problems, and all of these are related to adverse health outcomes. Often our, our renters are significantly challenged um, financially. They may live in poor conditions, and so their health outcomes suffer for that. And so we want to make sure that these apartments that they're living in are up to code and up to standard and are a, a healthy environment so their kids can get a good start at school. Um, they can continue to go to work and not miss work from preventable illnesses and disease. Do you deal with things quickly other than housing? Do you deal with other environmental? Uh, we do. We deal with pretty much all things lead. Uh -huh. uh, we always uh, joke a little bit in our laboratory, <laughs> but we've recently published a paper on lead and imported hot sauces uh -huh. um, and looked at different brands that contain some lead. We've done work on artificial turf and uh, wow. published a, a story on artificial turf and artificial turf removal. And then a lot of what we kind of call atypical sources. We're a little uh, newer neighborhood. Our houses aren't quite as old as the mm -hmm. East Coast, so we see a lot of imported things. We see home remedies, we may see ethnic remedies that contain lead that people are giving to their children. So we have some unique exposures here that we have to deal with a little differently than other parts of the world. You're the heavy metal prof. Yeah. Right. Sean, thank you very much for being with us. We appreciate it. Earlier this year, UNLV opened a geovisualization lab, a place for scientists to display and shape their work. Cassidy Forrester has the story. Scientists collect a lot of data, and now, thanks to UNLV's new geovisualization lab, they have a place to display their results in meaningful ways. Funded by the Nevada EPSCoR Climate Change Project, UNLV's new core facility integrates visualization tools with multidisciplinary expertise. The idea is that uh, researchers from any discipline can come and use the facility. Researchers that are dealing with any kind of spatial data can come here and look at multiple data sets simultaneously. People who are in um, animations uh, can use this facility. Uh, biological sciences, if uh, there are visualizations like X-ray imaging or uh, 3D visualization, they can use this facility. The facility features a flat panel tiled wall to display multiple data sets simultaneously, a large screen 3D display, wireless keyboards and movable podium, flexible seating and teleconferencing controls. It took uh, about a year to build the lab, starting from the point we hired the consultant, then the contractor. Having many ways to display critical data helps scientists share their work with others. And that's why this is so important, because it gives us another avenue to talk to the people who are not in the research world, but the public, the people who really matter most, the policy makers. These are the ones that are going to make the difference, not us scientists. We have all the equipment, we have all the hardware. Now it's getting the word out there that it's available for a scientist to use and to show off the great work that we're doing here at UNLV. Joining me now is somebody who played a key role in building that geo-visualization lab. Haroon Steven is an assistant professor of civil and environmental engineering. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. That's cool. Tell us about the lab. Well, a uh, geo-visualization facility is part of the GIS and remote sensing core lab. GIS means geographic information systems. So this facility provides us with a uh, large visual real estate on the walls and also it provides us capability to interact with um, uh, data sets so that you can visualize the data. Uh, it can be research data, it can be educational data uh, in a ways that you wouldn't be able to see otherwise. Uh, for example, you can look at uh, 3D images mm -hmm. and uh, fly over the terrain to get a different feel which you wouldn't otherwise um, have. Kind of give a way in it to kind of get that aha moment? Yes. So. Uh, so that's one thing. Then the additional part is looking at multiple sources. So uh, we have a tiled wall, which is a, a, a multiple monitors mm -hmm. arrayed together. Uh, and we, we can look at 
uh, data coming from different sources at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and that, again, gives you a different kind of capability uh, to compare and ins get further insight into those data sets. Who would be people who would use this lab? Who uh, is using it? Well, uh, currently uh, it's being used by uh, researchers. So several faculty who are uh, uh, some in the x-ray imaging, um, then water resources. Um, I have faculty from the Ur College of Urban Affairs. Um, and these faculty are using it. Um, I also invite uh, people from the uh, agencies in the city. Uh, we haven't had much success in that area yet, but the idea is that we can bring uh, agency partners uh, so that they can use this facility as a decision support tool uh, in their policy making or decision making processes. You were also talking about some of your research and what you're, what you're up to these days. Uh, myself, I, my, nowadays my interest has been primarily in urban climate. Uh, in particular, I'm looking at the urban uh, heat island effect. Uh, we talked about that a lot when I was at Channel 8 and how it's warmer here because of the heat island effect. Well, uh, parts of Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. And then I'm also looking at urban uh, flooding. Um, in urban heat island effect, actually, we, we have found out that um, in arid environments and semi-arid environments, the way we have here in Las Vegas, when you build a new development, uh, you actually reduce the temperature instead of increasing oh, because wow. the natural terrain would have uh, soil which would heat up faster than after development when we actually bring in vegetation, we bring in water, uh, we bring in shading. So what we have found out that in, in these kind of environments, in a lot of places, especially golf courses and mm -hmm. uh, uh, areas where there's more turf, uh, 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 grass, uh, we actually reduce the temperature. Wow, fascinating. And the other, the other part of that you were talking about? The other one is urban flooding. Um, uh, recently, uh, actually last year, we had some major yes. flooding events, especially the September 11 one. Uh, and in Las Vegas, we have very little rain, about four inches on average, but it rains uh, all significantly at all at <laughs> once. So I don't think our city is, uh, uh, is capable ha of handling every time a major event happens. We have a uh, reasonable flood control system. We have uh, the drainage inlets that kind of take away that water, but they're not always sufficient to do that. And what happens, what happened on 9-11, where we had uh, one of the UNLV parking lots mm -hmm. filled with water. And many places, uh, else, other places in Las Vegas, we saw similar kind of trends. So what we are trying to do in this research is we are uh, understanding how these urban catchments that catch the water behave, because these are very dynamic processes. The minute you create, change the street. I was just to say new development changes the whole Changes map. the catchment. So yeah. um, it has to be updated on a regular basis and at the same time for the people who are um, in uh, law enforcement or rescue, they need this information updated as well. So we are trying to build that database uh, for the city uh, that will help us understand the flooding and preventions better. All right, making it better for all of us. Yes. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> thank we you really much. appreciate you being with us. Well, that is going to do it for tonight. Be sure to join us again for our next episode of UNLV's Research Files. That's coming up. Good night, everybody. <laughs>